Welcome to episode 002 of the Imperial Tides podcast. I'm your host, the great and powerful 21st century Holden Caulfield, and I'm joined today by the illustrious, eminent uh, Simone of the Philippines. How are you doing today, Simone? Oh, good. I'm well. I'm doing well. I hope you guys are also doing well. Yeah, what'd you, uh, what'd you do today, Simone? What'd you get up to? Um, typical stuff of everyday life. Wake up, dodge, and sleep again. Yeah? Okay, cool. Did you get that, uh, that passport you were trying to get yet? Or, uh, how's that coming along? Nah, uh, I need to wait until my birthday before I, I get the access to apply for the passport. I'm too young. <laughs> oh, why is it, is the uh, minimum age uh, 18 over there? Yeah, there's so much paperwork for if I, if I, um, under, if I do it now, I think I need to wait for it uh, till I'm I the well, right age. That's too bad, but you know, maybe that's a, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it'll give you some time to run over your ideas and, you know, run over your options and figure out what's best for you. But, uh, anyway, uh, we, today, we just got done watching a, um, a very interesting, uh, episode in the uh the the play for today anthology series by channel i believe it's channel four of the bbc uh this was uh the accidental just called accidental death of an anarchist uh 1983 starring gavin richards as the maniac uh it's a play it's based on a play uh written by uh, the italian playwright dario fo that premiered in 1970 Considered a classic of 20th century fic- uh, theater, it has been performed across the world in more than 40 countries. The play itself is based on the 1969 Piazza Fontana uh, bombing, which was the uh, the bombing of an agricultural bank in Milan. Uh, it was done by a far-right political group known as the Ordin Nuovo, uh, who did it... Th- as part of uh, during the it was during the years of lead in Italy, and if you don't know what the years of lead in Italy are, it, it was essentially a, a period of social and political turmoil in Italy that lasted from the late 1960s until the late 1980s, marked by a wave of both and here's the the key thing here both far left and far right incidents of political terrorism. So both sides of the political spectrum were um, committing some pretty heinous acts of uh, political violence and 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 such during this this period of, of 20 years in Italy, mainly northern Italy. Um, and among those many terroristic acts was the Piazza Fontana bombing in December of 1969, upon uh, uh, around which this uh, this play, Accidental Death of a Communist, or uh, sorry, Accidental Death of an Anarchist, rather, Anarchist, is based. Uh, the bombing killed 17 people and wounded 88, that same afternoon, the same afternoon that the the bomb that went off in the National Agricultural Bank, uh, that same afternoon, three other bombs were detonated in Rome and Milan, and another was found unexploded. Uh, without getting into too many other details, this is the this is essentially the backdrop for this play, which is a political farce, uh, poking fun at the the sort of the let's say the incompetence of the 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 police, I, I suppose, and and. The, the competence of the it- Italian police, but also the, um, hmm, the, oh, the r- ridiculousness of the far left. It, it, it creates caricatures out of the, the, or far right, sorry, rather far right. I got to be careful with my words here. The far right. The main character, the protagonist is you know, known as the maniac. And at, in the films, towards the end of the f- uh, film's third act, he reveals himself to be a member of uh, a far right uh, political group. And that seems to be the main concern of this, this, this play and, and this work, it is interesting to note that the playwright Dario Fo had a socialist father growing up and was, uh, at the age of 16, forced to serve in Mussolini's uh, fascist army, which would explain his uh, political leanings towards the left. Uh, later in life, he was also uh, a 9-11 conspiracy theorist, uh, strangely enough, but... Um, Without saying too much more, uh, let's let's dive into the the actual work itself. Simone, what did you think of the play? I think it's fun. I, I never thought that it would be so serious. At at the end, I thought it's just a simple play with 
to make the people people up. I don't know. It's just my first time to watch um, a piece like this. And uh, and how would you say that uh, that experience was? Go into a little more of the details of you know what it was like to be a viewer uh, in uh, to a play like this. It's a it's a metafictional political farce, and we'll get into it in a little bit. But I, I just want to know what of your your what your initial response to it was. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, give you a sense that you're included in the um, in the play itself. Then you. Uh, you're here to the lab to laugh at this and uh, the, the things that they're talking about because you can relate to those things. Did you find it funny? Yeah, I think it's sarcastic at times. Did you uh, did you laugh a lot while you were watching it? Did you like physically laugh out loud? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Really interesting because I I only laughed twice and uh, both times were a bit. Um, Sarcastically, myself, I was a bit sardonic. Uh, what What did you say you would give this film out of ten if you had to rate it? I think I'll give it a seven. A seven, and uh, what are your reasons for that? Maybe it's a bit too old, and I think there's a lot of things that are happening. Uh, what were some of the goods? What were, what were some of your favorite aspects t uh, of this play? What were some of its virtues? Let's say. I think the. The ending part of the play, but it all summarize what it is all about. I like about. It. Okay, and do you do you feel that you had a sense of what the the message was uh, behind the the play? Do you do you know what the message was? Can you uh, articulate it in, in words, perhaps? Uh, I don't think that I. I thought it's just a play, um, and then I think it. It could be something related to politics and then things that are happening, but not exactly that, because it's just my first time to get exposed to this kind of things, especially these themes. I see, I see. Um, well, for me personally, I would I would have to give this one a hard... Like a, I, I think this is even too much, but I would give it a 4 out of 10 um, for a number of reasons, but I... For starters, let's let's break down exactly what this play is because it's a little it's a little hard to uh, to explain. It's kind of hard to get into. It's a pretty uh, hefty subject, I'd say. Um, but what we have here with Death of an Anarchist, nineteen eighty three, Death of an Anarchist, nineteen eighty three, commissioned by Channel Four of the BBC, is a it's a what I, what I would consider to be a bad British adaptation of a politically biased uh, farce. From Italy, or a biased political farce from Italy. Uh, it's I, I, I find it, uh, you know, it's Marxist uh, left leaning. It's let's see, it's not really. I don't know. It's not it's not competent enough to be much uh, uh, like of a of a threat, you know, to anything. But I, I I think for one thing, you know, regardless of I'll just prefer this right now because this is a bit of a complicated subject. But whether you are you know a more a left leaning person or a right leaning person, you know, liberal or conservative or or whatever, uh, I I tend personally to I I am a, I would consider myself a moderate, a political independent because I don't believe. In the political scale, I don't think it's a good idea to pick one side over the other. I don't think that um, political parties or political, uh, you know, directions, <laughs> left or right, I don't think they hold claim to uh, aspects of basic human decency. So, for example, I don't think liberals own. Um, I don't think liberals own and, and are able to gatekeep. Um, not being a racist, you know, I don't think it's a, a liberal thing for me to um, not want to kill my next door neighbor on the sole basis that he's, um, you know, African, for example. Or, and at the same time, you know, on the other side of the, the spectrum, I don't think that it's a conservative thing necessarily to save your money to budget it. I don't think that that's something that, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think political groups can own things that are generally just, just basic universal, you know, co common sense things, you know, basic shit, you know, just, and, and this is something that bothers me with a lot of, um, uh, with a lot of artists and a lot of playwrights, especially theater. Theater is very, um, with the exception of maybe Greek theater, ancient theater, 
Um, I would say that a lot of uh, plays and, and stuff like this, they tend to have this extreme um, bias, and it, and it just so happens to be a bias towards the left. And the reason for that, I, I'm assuming my working hypothesis anyway, is that uh, this is because uh, a lot of these um, these artists and these playwrights and whatnot are wealthier. You know, they are part of the upper class. They've made a lot of money. They uh, run in certain, you know, they, na they navigate through certain... Uh, let's say, um, social groups, uh, social spheres, uh, they are, you know, they're rich and they don't like being rich and they hate themselves. And so they take that out on the audience. They, they, and they try to, uh, change the way you think by having these politically charged, um, comedies and farces and w what have you. And, and, and it's a mess, you know, and I, I don't think that artists should do that. I think artists don't really have any reason to get involved in politics. I don't think that, yeah, for example, I don't think a novelist is, smart enough I, I i don't i don't think that politics is the answer for one thing but for another i don't think that artists and and, and you know, novelists and playwrights and what have you should be getting involved i don't think it matters what their opinions on these uh you know controversial issues and whatnot are i i, I think it's presumptuous for them to assume that anyone cares what they have to say when it comes to you know uh, elections and and you know certain political candidates and whatnot what have you, and I, I think really it just serves as a testament, it stands as a testament to how uh, self-important some of these people get, because just of, of how out of touch they are, you know, even if they start out like um, Dario Fo, for example, you know, working class, um, part of the, I guess, what Marx would term the proletariat, uh, you know, fame does a lot to you, fame and success do a lot to you, and I think that this play is just a perfect example of that, now, maybe not the play itself, because I've, I've never seen the original play, so I can't really speak to its own merits, but just going over the synopsis of it, and seeing this adaptation of it, uh, it doesn't seem very good, um, and this adaptation of it, the Channel 4 BBC version, is, um, it's so incompetent and so confusing and so cringeworthy that uh, the message gets lost anyway, and so that's why I have to give it a 4 out of 10. Otherwise, I would give it a 1 for being, I would say, dangerous and manipulative, because I don't like anything that uh, that tries to uh, subvert the way, that tries to influence the way the, the audience thinks politically. I don't like anything like that. I, I think this is almost, uh, you know, it's farce, but I, I think it leans... Uh, very close, dangerously close. I would say not not we're not dangerously. Dangerously is exaggerating, but I would say that it's a it, it, it's a little too um, it's a little too politically charged for my personal tastes. Let's say, and you know, if it were uh, a conservative um, production, for example, and if, if if it was making fun of the left, I wouldn't like it. Uh, you know, I would I would dislike it just as much because I don't like any bias of any sort. Um, what do you have to say about that, Simone? Did you? get that did you glean that those, those sort of political implications um from the play that i did or you know w what do you have to say about that do you agree with me do you disagree uh comments concerns uh, i may agree i agree with you because here in the philippines there's, there's uh, the political parties has not much stand about things i mean they agree on some things and they didn't agree on something i mean it depends upon the situation it doesn't need to be you need to be always on the right or you need to be always on the right on the left you don't need to have um one and only stand in all of the things or you base your opinions on such people for example you're a web, web left left winger or right winger or totalitarian republican democrat i don't know how that's work but i think it doesn't uh should be uh it shouldn't be biased with I know with only one thing. I think it should be broad. I think it feels like that the film only uh, the play only shows one side of the of, of the issue. So that's I, I don't like. <laughs> well, at the beginning of the play or whatever it's supposed to be, there there's something there's a lot to break down here. It's it's a very it's actually it's a very complicated play and it's a very complicated mess. I would say, but um. The, the TV version that we watched is supposed to be some sort of metafictional narrative. Uh, you know, if you noticed, they have a, a, like, a like an audience, they have a crew, uh, they, have, they, they have like this li live audience. I can't tell if it's a real live audience or if they put it there as a joke, you know, and, and they break the fourth wall constantly. They're, they're speaking directly to the, uh, to the viewer at all times, like con just every two seconds almost, you know, a lot of the time. Um, 
And and the original play does have uh, some instances of this as well, in which the the protagonist, who's called just simply referred to as the maniac, the maniac uh, does address the audience um, towards the end of the original play, and I'm sure throughout that as well. But in this uh, in this BBC version, uh, it, they try to make it they try to turn it into some sort of I don't even know what it's supposed to be some sort of television show within the play itself. So there is this narrative, there's this metafictional aspect to it, a narrative within a narrative, a story within a story, and that does uh, uh, fall in line with the the play's themes of um, reenactment, reconstruction. Uh, I, I think in in a sense the play is a testament, or it, it's a uh, maybe a love letter to the chaos of narrative, perhaps, to the absurdities of acting. There are a lot of, because, uh, you know, a lot of it is about trying to reconstruct the events that led to the uh, titular anarchist's death in the first place. And the policemen are trying to, because the policemen are corrupt in this, they're trying to lie and come up with all these weird stories. And it, it, it's ridiculous, you know, all these different uh, scenarios they try to play out to um, to get the, the heat off themselves and to make themselves look innocent and um there's a lot of that and so then there's there's there are points in the movie where it gets really complicated there's so many layers of acting that it's hard to keep uh, track of for instance I, I wrote it down here the worst or maybe not the worst but that's not the right word for it but maybe the the most complicated it gets is when you have um you have uh, let's see let me let me try to find it real quick let me pull it up uh my notes are a bit messy so forgive me um, is there anything, while I look for this, is there anything you want to add, Simone? Um, you know, just want to talk for me, basically, you want to talk? I don't know, it's just, um, uh, so new to me, I think, especially the language, um, they talk a bit fast, so <laughs> I can get in touch with the things that I say, and there's no sub subtitle, but it's a good start to improve my English, I think, and I, I just like you said, there are things that are too complicated to get, and especially on some things that are ha happening or what they are talking about. What is it all about? I think I don't know. Uh, okay. Um. Well, I I uh, let me try to. I cannot seem to find it, but um, let's start by breaking down the protagonist for a second. Uh, the protagonist is the, the maniac, and he seems to be this weird sort of this, this eccentric master of disguise. Um, when the play starts, he's getting in, interrogated by Inspector Francisco Bertozzo, who is the Bertozzo, uh, who isn't very smart, and um, he's the one who makes that fourth wall breaking joke about how because this is a left wing uh, play, you know, we're going to make the police look really stupid. Which is itself, you know, it's it's having your cake and eating it. You know, it's letting the audience know that it knows that it is a politically charged play, but at the same time, it doesn't care. You know, it's kind of rubbing it in your face. It's like, yes, if you don't like that we're uh, left-leaning or whatever, you can go fuck yourself. That's basically what they're saying, at least in my opinion. But, you know, I, it's obvious to me anyway. You know, I, I, I'm trying my best not to get biased about this, but it, I, I, I would say, personally, I, I'm biased when it comes to bias. You know, like I said, I like things that are moderate. I like things that don't touch politics. And if they do, explore both sides, you know, and, and explore both sides fairly and try to, um, you know, maybe touch on the more universal aspects of, of political issues and whatnot. This is a, this play is a product of a, of a very tumultuous time in Italian history. Uh, but this televised adaptation of it isn't it was made 10 years later 20 years later even you know like it was, or maybe not 20 but you know it made, it made a really long time after um it doesn't really have much to do with it i, I don't think that the british sensibilities really uh, match with the italian humor i think that's one of the big problems with the play itself is that it's kind of cringeworthy it reminds me of the uh, the monty python uh, films if you're familiar with those uh, but without the 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 cleverness, without the wit, without the rules, you know that this it's so chaotic that it doesn't even have it has even less logic than Monty Python. You know what's funny about Monty Python is that it has a sort of anti logic. You know, um, it it needs to have something to contrast against. It needs to have the the basic rules of of reality to uh, kind of bite back against humorously. Monty Python also isn't you know super political as far as I'm aware. Uh, 
but that's that's a lot of what makes this play fall flat for me is just the the fact that it isn't very funny it isn't very entertaining um i kept checking my phone you know I, I checked my phone every 20 minutes or so and i was i was shocked that it was still going on i mean it's like an hour and 20 minutes and it just it's it's a lot of of farce and farce admittedly farce is the most difficult genre to pull off it's very hard to make these these overblown over saturated over exaggerated um you know things funny parodies funny you know it can get annoying very grating very easily very quickly and it's definitely not for everyone i wouldn't say that farce has universal appeal in the slightest in the least uh but at the same time i, I still do think that there's a certain way to do it even in anarchy there there you know there was a good quote someone once said that you know there's eventually going to come a point if you were if you want to be an anarchist you know you need to to organize and so what happens when the anarchists start all getting together and, and organizing and, and they have a leader and everything it's not really anarchy anymore you know uh maybe i didn't do a good job of explaining that but um the basic point being that uh you can't really have chaos for too long because um everything eventually starts to uh, you know an order starts to take form and, and shape and anything really uh, is there anything you want to add to that, uh, Simone? I think you're right. It's 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 sometimes it's boring. I don't I don't get in touch with some things. I think I I don't have anything to do. So <laughs> I just love at some parts that I can relate, and then at some parts that I get really bored. What were the parts that you could relate to? Um, the simple humors, for example, uh, when he drunk his, um, his eye, his eyeballs and, um, just the simple stupid things. But I think it's a bit exaggerated on those parts. The acting was so pretentious and exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which isn't inherently bad, but it needs to be done right and the execution was off, I think, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have exaggerated acting. Um, South Park is a good example of a, of a sort of a political, it's a satire, it's not necessarily a farce, it's a satire. Uh, farces are a little more extreme, I, I believe, that's how you would uh, categorize those. But, um, you know, in South Park, it's pretty ridiculous at times, but it has a certain way of going about it. And, you know, sometimes it, it, it does well, and sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, it's a hit or miss thing, and it definitely isn't for everybody. But there's a reason, all I'll say is that there's a reason why, and maybe this is comparing apples to oranges too, so feel free to argue with me on, on this one particular point, but uh, there, there's a reason why South Park is still kind of, maybe not beloved, but well-known and, and you know, significant today, whereas accidental death of an anarchist, you know, is, as far as I'm aware, kind of this thing that's reserved for the, the elite, you know um very niche very very much not in the mainstream let's say and so i, I kind of find that a bit useless almost and you know maybe it wasn't dario foe's point to uh make this a, a widespread thing that does kind of influence the masses let's say you know maybe it was meant to be a niche sort of uh you know clicky kind of elitist thing maybe not elitist maybe uh, maybe i'm being too harsh when i say that but you know um, maybe this was only meant to be reserved for the the theatrical, let's say, theatrical, cultured, cultivated circles that would watch this kind of thing anyway because they find it entertaining regardless. Um, maybe this was a sort of inside joke, you know? And that's kind of how I feel about the adaptation itself. Not necessarily the original play, but the adaptation itself, the BBC Channel 4 version. Um... I thought I, I thought some of my problems with it. I thought it was way too self indulgent and intentionally stupid for its own good. Uh, it, it was like watching a bunch of uh, pretentious assholes act retarded for an hour and twenty minutes. Uh, the, the the characters all acted the same, which isn't necessarily bad. Again, but they just didn't execute it well. They, there was no point for them to act all the same. It was excruciating to watch, you know, um, and, and there was nothing to really differentiate them from one another necessarily. Uh, the actors were not funny. That, that, that's a problem, you know, if you're going to do a farce where everything is ridiculous and, and laugh out loud, you know, stupid, then, then they have to be at least a little funny, and I, I didn't really find them that funny. The only two parts I laughed at were, uh, first when um, the guy had the flower pot on his uh, right foot. I, I don't know why that made me laugh, but it did. And so I'll give them that, you know, that that, that just made me laugh, and I, and I don't really know why it, it did, but it did. So, you know, 
kudos to you for that. Uh, I, I'll give you credit where credit's due, uh, play. But, um, you know, and then the second time I laughed was when they started doing the, uh, the, the guitar song number. They just started breaking out in, in guitar and, and singing, and I just I thought that was a little funny just on account of how absurd it was, which, you know, that's what a farce should do. It should be so ridiculous that you can't help but laugh. This one, though, I, I the, the political uh, under, you know, the political um, undertones just kind of killed it for me. Knowing that it was uh, trying to, you know, it, it was just, it, it felt a little too manipulative and it felt a little too mean-spirited and very charged. And that just, I don't think it really, they don't go hand in hand. There, it's very difficult to pull off, and I would be surprised. I would, I would be impressed if anyone could pull it off, honestly. Um, especially when you take such a firm stance, a firm, clear stance, with regard to where you are on the the political scale. Let's say, you know, um, uh, it's probably better in Italian, uh, and I have a feeling that to a certain degree the Brits did ruin it. Uh, I. It just clashes, you know. I don't know. I, I think Italian sensibilities and, and British sensibilities, and also Italian, uh, let, let's say, conceptions of humor, as well as you know, British conceptions of humor, are, are just completely different. And I don't, I don't think they go well together. They're very bound to their cultures, their respective cultures. You know, I don't think, um, I don't think Italians find all the same things that Brits find funny, funny. You know, and and I just don't think it really translated well. I think it, this was a poor translation, a poor adaptation of a of a pretty dicey um, play to begin with. So the, the source material itself wasn't very, you know, it wasn't, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say it. It was, it was great, honestly. I don't, I don't really, you know, I don't know. Um, but I don't know if all the issues are really in the adaptation alone. I think the adaptation is just a part of, it's just one of the many uh, factors that contribute to this, uh, this televised play's failure, let's say, the work's failure overall. Um, did I mention the layers of acting yet, um, Simone? Did I talk about this? I, f I found the note, by the way. Uh, th at its most complex, the the story gets to the point where you have actors acting as actors, acting as exaggerated characters, doing a reenactment of a fictionalized set of interactions within a fictional with sorry with a fictional anarchist. So that's a that's actors acting as actors acting as exaggerated characters doing a reenactment of a fictional set of interactions with a fictional anarchist. That's how complicated it gets. And, it, you know, unique to this adaptation, they, they had like a boom mic. There was a part where the boom mic fell into the shot and they, you know, they got mad at them. And there was a part where the, the, the constable directly addresses the camera and talks to some crew guy named Scott. And, and you know, there, there's a part where um, the where Bortolzo uh, walks into the room before his cue, and then the uh, the actor, quote-unquote, the actor playing that character has to tell him to leave and come back. And so there are a lot of fourth-wall-breaking, kind of cheeky little moments like that. Um, how did you feel about the meta-fictional uh, narrative um, some uh, aspect of the, the play, Simone? What was your take on that, on the, the fourth-wall-breaking and such? Uh, I agree with you that uh, they're trying to, to include the audience to make, uh, to, I know, to tell that oh it's it's funny you need to laugh I need to they they really made it too pretentious and really exaggerated the acting uh there's no distinction between the characters about who they are or who they character they're just all exaggerated and act the same way so I think that's uh that that ruined the the play and then I agree with you with that each culture has have their own all have their own um, aspect when in our uh, preference when it comes to humor. So maybe the Italian humor is not it's not okay for the uh, it's not good for the British and the British and um, vice versa. I think. Yeah, and so that that actually leads me into an interesting question that I wanted to ask you. Um, as a Filipino, would you say that the humor in this would align with a lot of uh, the, the humor that that is prevalent in your country? Like, would you say that? Um, I don't know, would the average Filipino person find this play funny or would they just be confused? If they, and, and, and take into account, you know, like, let's just, let's remove the language barrier. So just, if, if they made a, a, a Tagalog version of this play and showed it in your village, for example, um, do you think a lot of people would find it funny or do you think they would um, not? What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think that there will be a language barrier because Filipinos are 
very good to understand English. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, you know, there's a lot of uh, wordplay and stuff in here. It's not. It's not. I'm not trying to say that you guys don't understand English. I mean, I, I know that you do. But um, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, I guess, kind of. Well, and especially in this the TV version, there's a lot of um wordplay that you know you need to be like a Brit to kind of get because there's a lot of there are a lot of like references to um english society and and wordplay like wordplay that even you know even scholars kind of have a hard time uh trying to figure out you know that that kind of thing you know uh so that that's what i meant um sorry proceed though continue Wh whatever you're going to say i don't think that they will find it funny because it wasn't uh it's too exaggerated just like i said earlier the the actors say too overacting i think they're overreacting or getting into the character to make it funny i think a good comedy doesn't need to be that exaggerated it depends upon the message uh, it's not actually depends on the conversation or the on the uh what do you call this speech or lines of the actors it well it it's also a good element but it should be in a balanced manner, I think. Because they look like a um, dumb <laughs> with all these things that they are doing, and it's too exaggerated. So you, you criticize it for being exaggerated, but then you laugh as you say that. Um, why do you think that is? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I don't have anything to do, so... I just laugh on some parts. It's not actually I laugh at every part of the movie. I think there are just some part acts that I can relate to when it comes to Filipino humor. Didn't you say that in the Philippines, it, it, uh, the one thing that's popular are, are those um, kind of exaggerated uh, uh, dramas, soap operas. Didn't you say that that was a, a very popular um, thing over there? Oh, it's exaggerated, but it's not in the way of the acting or the way they act. They look so goofy or they look so dumb. I think it's more on the facial expressions, I think. That's what made Filipino, that's a exaggerated part in Filipino comedies. So what, what, what makes the distinction between um, this, something like this, and, and one of those Filipino comedies like you mentioned? What do you think the most important thing is that that differentiates them, that separates them, makes them different? I think the character and the lines of the actors. I think the way they act and then giving their lines or act the, the way that they should do. That's, uh, it, because it's in the British part, I think it's too exaggerated. It's not in a balanced manner. I yeah, I would agree on that. I don't think it's necessarily a, a British issue, though. I mean, even though yeah, things like Monty Python are popular over there, you know, and and, and you know, a little around the world, of course. But you know, it does come from you know, Monty Python does come from the UK. Uh, I, I I think that it is yes, it's definitely that that does figure into it. As for the American perspective, by the way, which I almost forgot to talk about, maybe that's significant. Um, I think the U.S. is a very uh, you know because it is such a multicultural. Uh, place and and because I you know it, it's just it's so big and it's just you know it's just like anywhere really I mean but I, I think the difference between the U.S. and the in Europe is because a lot you know a lot of European uh, nations are so small like they all kind of have this unifying culture that they all live under um, I've never really felt that way about the U.S. necessarily uh, you can choose to engage or disengage with the culture as much as you like it really just depends on your personal preferences my parents are both political moderate, you know, moderates, both independents, uh, registered independent, or not, I mean, not even registered independents, so really truly independents, independent independents even. Um, but, you know, so we, we don't really get involved in a lot of uh, stuff. We kind of just keep to our own business. You know, my dad works, my mom cleans the house, and I just, I sit around all day reading books and watching movies and playing video games and stuff, you know, and that's our, that, that's our lives, you know, we don't really, it, 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 we, we see it all from the outside. We kind of have an outsider's perspective and, um. I feel like that's a lot of Americans. That's a lot of the U.S. Uh, and that's a lot of the world as well, but but especially the U.S., I would say. And so that's why, you know, that's why a lot of Europeans would look at us and go, you know, why aren't you guys, uh, you know, you guys are so disengaged. You guys don't even care about politics, you know, and, and it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It depends on how you do it, obviously. Um, I, do, I, I do think everyone should vote, um, even if it's for the lesser evil, even if it's for the candidate that you hate less than the other, you know, you should still do it. I think it's important, you know.
Uh, I think it's an in, 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 inalienable uh, right of the human spirit or what have you, human right. But um, yeah, I just I looking at it from a U.S. perspective, I I, I do see that the, the 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 televised version of this was very steeped in British humor, and it wasn't even a, a British creation. And I think that did clash. I think it. I, I, I don't think it really goes well together. I don't think they should have tried to make it their own thing. I, if anything, they should have just, like, if they were going to adapt it at all, they should have gotten actual Italians to do it in Italian and then just have subtitles. But then why would you go through all the effort to do that, you know? Um, I just think it was a mess from the start. I think it was a bad idea. And uh, I don't know. I mean, they're... What's worst of all? What's worst of all for for me really is that there's not really much to more to say about it. You know, this is this podcast is supposed to go for an hour. We're only on the second episode, and already I feel like we're I, I'm flubbing it up anyway. I don't know. <laughs> I feel really uh, ill prepared to to talk about this, and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope that I don't start crashing and burning. I hope this isn't a sign for the the future. But I mean, I just uh, maybe you know I, I think this was a really complicated one to try to start with. Ugh, but um. <laughs> There, there is a lot to break down, and I, I, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot to break down, but I also think we kind of got the the main point out of the way. I don't really think there's any use in really um, hair splitting. I don't know. Uh, how do you feel, Simone? I, I agree with you. I think in the first part, before we start shooting, I think I don't have much idea, or I don't. It doesn't appeal to me that much. I think it doesn't leave a message to me that. Oh, I need to ask something. I need to know something about it. I need to feel something about this film, about this play. Oh, what does it do to me? I think it's, it didn't did what it was supposed to do or make me feel uh, what I need to feel. I just it's just da okay. It's done. It's done, and it's done. It so it doesn't leave that much thing on you that where you're keeping hanging around or I don't know. That's it. Uh, and do you think that's detrimental? Like, do you think that's um, counterproductive to create a, a, a piece of art that defies meaning? Mm, it defies meaning. I think. I think it's okay, but it depends upon the approach, their approach on how they can. Uh, they will ex execute things. I think they didn't did well on executing what they execute or trying to portray what they wanted to tell. Uh, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. You said, "Oh yeah, 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 definitely for sure, for sure." And and um, but what what would you say, for example, to someone who who likes this film? What what if someone who oh, likes this uh, or maybe I, I keep calling it a film, a, a televised play, I guess is the way I would describe it. What would you say to someone who uh, counter argued your point by saying that um, you know, well, it's supposed to be bad? What would you say to that? It's supposed to be a mess. How would you argue against that statement? Maybe I'll ask him or whatever, <laughs> whoever he is. That why did he like it? I mean, I want to know what's the thing that make it, that amuses him about this uh, this certain play. I think. I don't know. I don't have. It doesn't have much thing that appeals to me. So maybe in some people, it appeals to them. So why? What is it that they like it? Yeah, yeah. I I think um I think one of the things they might like are the uh, the structural jokes, the the narrative deconstructionist humor. Uh, the whole play does. I mean, I mean, the whole play kind of does. It seems like a joke that uh, is too clever for its own good. You know, it seems like some weird sort of inside joke for those in the industry, uh, like a comedy made for and by theater people, you know, if that makes sense. And and I I guess if you're in that, if you're in that very small group of people, you might get a kick out of it. But um, kind of like with Edna, you know, there were there were good parts. There were good pieces that could have um, stood maybe better off on their own or mixed with other things. If the approach was adjusted a little bit, uh, it, it could have gone a little better. I think they re revised it somehow. Uh, it could have worked, I, I think, a, a bit better anyway. It could have been competent. I, I personally don't think that, you know, this televised play as it stands is competent. That's why I give it a four. I, in my personal uh, standing, as far as I would go, I would say that like a, a um, kind of like, you know, a grading system where uh, a D, a 60% is passing, 
I would say that a six out of 10 is passing for me. And so this is four out of 10 for me. I would say it's two stars below or it's two points below passing because it just doesn't work at all. Like it just doesn't work when you, when you put it all together. But at the same time, it made me laugh twice. So I had to give it two points for that. And I had to give it two other points for not being, um, for basically just not being static, I, I suppose, for being something that was put together, that was produced to that thought and, and effort went into and, and just didn't, you know, it didn't pan out in the end, but still people did take their time to, to make it. So I, I want to give some consideration to that, I suppose, but um, I, I can really only give it a four out of 10. Uh, now that we've kind of discussed it a little more, 40 minutes into this uh, this recording, how would you, what would you rate it? Um, would you still keep your rating from earlier? How, how would you rate it now, uh, Simone? Maybe I'll give it a five or a four and four and five. I think I shouldn't be it shouldn't be rating things from the start because um, with the help uh, when engaging in the conversation, I get a grasp more what is it all about or what are the things that I should like or I did it didn't appeal to me. So I'll give it a five. Just like you say, it's time for the airport. I think. Well, you know, we, we do the initial rating and then we do this rating uh, because I don't want to like influence, I don't want you to influence me and I don't want to in, want me, I don't want to influence you uh, when we do these at first. So I want your like, you know, the, the, the reason why I do them at the beginning is so that we can have a more like honest, um, I guess, gauge of how we really felt about it initially watching it. You know, it's an initial reaction and then it's a, a uh, let, let's say a reaction in hindsight. So it's good to compare them. That's why I do that, um, and I think it's I think it's a good idea. You know, I don't uh, I don't know. I, I what, were you gonna say something? Oh yeah, I I agree with you that you should do that initial and then another rating. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's supposed to be a good idea, but then sometimes you get ones like this that are just really kind of hard to um, to talk about and hard to define and hard to really break down. But, um, uh, you know, I guess one thing we could do now is uh, maybe take a look at the protagonist a little further, the the maniac, as he was called. The, uh, I, I wrote down some of the things that he does, because he is a bit of a... He's not a complex character, I wouldn't say, but he is complexly constructed. Uh, in the sense that there are a lot of layers to his absurdity, I suppose. Uh, he talks fast. He makes strange animal noises at, at times. Uh, he wears various disguises. He he's breaking the fourth wall constantly. Uh, he's also and, and and also above all, he's an actor within the televised play itself. And and you know he likes to break into song and dance at at various points. Uh, what did you think of the protagonist? Did you did you like him? The the maniac, the one who kept uh, you know changing clothes and everything. What did you think of him? No, I don't. I don't like his character. I think it's it doesn't find the balance on things. I think it's okay to have that character with such an exaggerated, exaggerated, uh, exaggerated acts. But it's been like that. In he's been consistently in that way from most of the all of the plays. So and then the other characters didn't blend him well. I think there should be. An exaggerated character, and then should be some dull characters to make things balanced and more moderate. So you think he would have been funnier if there was a straight man? Oh, mm, I think so, but it's depend on the how how they will introduce that character. Uh, okay, let's get into revisions now. Uh, how would you fix his character? How would you introduce him, for example, to make him more effective? The the maniac. I don't know. I haven't done any <laughs> this before. Uh, maybe I'll. Maybe he's. Uh, I'll. I'll make him in a bit mysterious type of a person. It doesn't have much. I think his character or it speaks all for him itself. I think there should be a mystery about him. So you think they needed to build up to the absurdity? He needed to have some sort of um, maybe anonymity or, or shrouding of, of dramatic, um, let's say, uh, curiosity to to him to make him more compelling and effective. Oh yeah, I think so. That uh, because in the film he he just have one character. He's he's always been like that in all the film, uh, in almost his acts. 
So yeah, I think I agree with you. And um, so, how would you revise the play overall? If you, if you, if someone gave you a script of this play and told you to to fix it, what would you do to fix it? How would you, if you had to rewrite the entire thing, how would you do it? Let's say to make it better. To make I it better. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll change the, the plot, I, the location of the film. I think it could be done better if they, they were some, somewhere else or outside. It's changing his character when he meets somebody. That's probably a good way to execute it. Uh, well, for me personally, I, I think I, I am of the belief that this is, um, like way too messed up to fix honestly i'm a bit pessimistic about the chances of making it you know somewhat tolerable it's uh it's biased for from the start you know the writer who wrote it is politically biased and that's an issue uh if i were to to uh, the changes i would make would be way too significant uh to I, I would change it so much to the point where it, it wouldn't even be the same thing anymore. It would it would be unrecognizable. I would take out all the pol- I would either take out all the political stuff or or um, make fun of both sides because I think it's something is fine when you make fun of both sides or when you make fun of everyone. You know, when you only make fun of one group or whatever, that's biased. So uh, that's what I would do first of all, first and foremost. Secondly, I would have it be in, in its native uh, language with the you know actual Italians speaking Italian and. Y- you know, bringing back that sensibility to it because that really is, it does seem to be integral to the original work itself. Um, biased as it may be, it, it is an Italian play and it, it's based on an, a, an act of terrorism that occurred in Italy in 1969, you know. So during that, that um, you know, the years of lead, which is, uh, it's an Italian, it's a, it was a moment in Italian history, you know, it's, it's too important to ignore I, I, it's strange. It's like if I, um, I don't know. It's like if they made a, a play about nine eleven in Iceland or something, you know, and they set it in, in, in Iceland or Greenland and it was a bunch of, um, you know, fisher fishing people, you know, villagers or something, fishing villagers trying to, I don't know. You know what I mean? It, it's like that. It's, it's, it just doesn't really, it doesn't work as well. I don't think it could work. There's, there's always the possibility. I, I, the thing about art is that I don't like to, I don't want to try to, I don't want to eliminate any options, possibilities, but it's like, there are just there are some that work way better than others, and I think there are certain things that you should just leave on the experiment, leave to experimentation, leave to theory, you know, leave behind in the the writing notebook. I, I would say the scrapbook. I don't know, but um, yeah, it's it's very it's like trying to mix uh, water and oil. I think in this, and it's just it's not great. I don't think um, thoughts. Hmm. I I don't know if I <laughs> it was really okay that I'm I'm most part of this episode. I agreed with you. And it's all about Italian, and then <laughs> and there's a British adaptation, so that didn't make it well. I think that's absurd. Uh. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I think this one's pretty ubiquitously a, a you know not not good. So I don't I don't blame you for you know whatever but it's just it's yeah it, it sucks let's just be honest it's not a very good play and i don't really know how many other ways to say it sucks other than i guess to tie it back to the the political stuff again um you know i hate i hate when people turn politics into a, a um a team sport you know and especially what's going on with, with what's going on today uh where they've taken you know shows like big franchises like star wars and and star trek and doctor who and everything and they've kind of turn them into these things that are, you know, these political messagey kind of things that just, they, they were never meant to be in the first place. Um, and, and also how social media affects the way people are argue and how, uh, there really isn't a lot of civil discourse left in the, in the public eye anyway, because now it's popular because, you know, you go on Twitter and you say something stupid and you get a bunch of likes for it. If you, if you come on Twitter and you say something reasonable, you know, common sense and, and, and you know, that it's, just, it's more nuanced and a little more complicated than people don't really care as much they don't want to read it and the the character counts and everything i point being that this just i I think it kind of just reminds me of that you know and maybe that's why i'm so harsh on it because it's just a little too real for me right now you know um 
with everything that's going on in the world, especially the pandemic, you know, we're living in some in, in, in the U.S. I don't know about you in the Philippines, Simone, but in, in the U.S. it's a pretty pol- politically divisive time, you know, with um, with Trump and Biden and how they're trying to, you know, the, 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 there's a whole lawsuit and everything and about, about the voting fraud and stuff. It's just it's not a the, the ballot count and everything. It, it's not a good time to be watching things. Maybe it's the best time to be watching things like this. It's productive. You know, I have been able to, I, I think, I, you know, even though this, um, even though this episode of the podcast was a little shaky, uh, I, I still feel as if I got something out of it. I, I was able to identify through conversation. I was able to identify and through the example of accidental death of an anarchist, I was able to identify some of the things that I don't like about the, the political uh, sphere to these days, you know, the political atmosphere, the climate in the U S um, it's too divisive. It's too much of a team sport. It's just people yelling at each other and, and people, people putting way too much stake in ideology as well. That's a big issue. Uh, I hate how people try to, to take the easy route. You know, it's this intellectual shortcut y- instead of, of thinking about every single individual issue, uh, on its own and, and taking into account every single, like, uh, let's say possible scenario when it comes to things like abortion and, and, you know, let's, let's take abortion for example, you know, um, abortion is complicated because there are, there are some cases where people just have sex to, to have fun and then they get the abortion and they don't have to worry about it. They're being irresponsible. They don't care what they're doing, you know? Uh, but then there are also people who, you know, there are people who get assaulted and, and have to have kids or people who have kids who get pregnant by mistake and, and can't afford to provide for that child. And so giving birth to that child would, um, lead to a, a lower quality of life for both the parents, parent, parents, and, uh, the, the child itself, right? Um, it's nuanced. There are, there are a lot of different, uh, possible examples. And so it's not all one easy thing. You can't put it into a box. You can't slap a label on it. You can't make it an ideological thing and expect to, to, um, to solve it right away. You know, um, just because you're liberal, you don't, you don't save the world by being only liberal. You don't save the world by only being conservative or whatever political parties, you know, they, they have weight and whatnot, but they, they're not everything. They're not the end all be all government is not the end all be all, you know, um, I don't mean to be this politically charged. I don't really even. I didn't really want to talk about politics on this podcast. It's, it's supposed to be a medium crit, media criticism thing, but I just, you know, with something like this, you can't help but uh, but think about this kind of thing. And I just, I think moderation is just a, common sense. You know, I, I think moderation is the best thing to, to do. You know, political independence. Think for yourself. Think very, very, you know, concentrate. Like think very deeply about these issues. Don't let the media tell you what to think. Don't let other people tell you what to think. Hell, don't let me tell you what to think. You know. Um, <laughs> honestly, the only thing I'll tell you how to, what to do, the only thing I'll tell you what to do, and the only thing that's appropriate to tell anyone what to do is to think for themselves, you know, be your own person, have your own brain, you know, be, be self-determined. Self-determination is the most important thing. It's the highest human aspect, high, highest human virtue, I would say. Uh, anything you'd like to comment, uh, on there, uh, Simone? I think the Philippines is lucky because we don't have such, uh, parties that we that we depended on on our everyday type scenarios that should be an issue and then we should base on things on the political parties so there's not just thing I like that here there's some that exist but people or the senators have different views on things it wasn't that unified so I think that's a good part of the political system here but I don't think it's still okay because the justice system here doesn't work that well. So it's just a different issue. So um, there are some people that that she'd like to mention on the social media, um, exhorting their rights about telling about who's the best president or who should be the next politician that should run or something like that. But um, it doesn't mean that you should depend on them. You should have your own voice or your own your own decisions about their art for your, uh, for your that one. I don't think that there's political groups here that manipulate the people. I think people here have their own rights to vote whoever they wanted to. That's good. That's good. You know, um, it's a shame that, that, you know, like you said, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of corruption in the Philippines. Uh, but I mean, at least you guys don't have to worry about, um, you know, all the, all the bullshit that, uh, I guess we in the U S have to, for whatever fucking reason, because people are so spoiled that they don't even know how good their lives are. You know, they have to bitch about everything and then, and then there you have it there. Everything falls apart. You know, I don't know, but I, I don't know. Anyway, um, let me ask you a question now, uh, Simone, uh, 
how do you think this this episode's going so far? I mean, it's almost over, but how do you think it it is? Do you think it's bad? I I kind of feel like it's bad. I think it's it's a good start because um start yesterday. I'm having my own opinions about things. I'm seeing see I'm looking at things that way more different than before. So I'm having my own opinions. Hearing your opinions make me think of my opinions. So that's a great way. You're having your own opinions, but you mostly agree with me on stuff. I mean, don't you think that seems a little uh, fishy? I mean, uh, I'm basing my opinions on what you just said, but still, there's it made me realize about something that it's not just your opinion. I mean, it might be my opinion before before we talk, and then I just realize it because you just said it. So. Something like that. It's not exactly. But it sounds like I'm basing your my opinions on you. Okay, no, I I get you. I get you. You know, that's good. Um, well, eventually, you know, hopefully, I start uh, getting opinions from you. So you know, it'll it'll go both ways. But um, uh, we're we're coming on the fifty five minute mark now, and in, in our episode, and uh, I I want to end with a would you rather question, like we did last time. But uh, before we we do that, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Simone. Would you be willing to do another episode today? Uh, would you be willing to record another episode of this? We'll watch something else and we'll do another episode. Do you have time? Oh, sure. I think that's a good idea. I'm just, I don't know how would I say this to you that I want another <laughs> to make another another episode because this one is not that good uh, yeah, we're- to talk about. You know, I, I believe in um, I believe in authenticity. You know, I, I think people should be honest with with whatever you know and I, and I this this the imperial tides podcast is it's supposed to be a very honest very genuine place for for very honest very genuine people to come on and just kind of talk about their honest genuine opinions on things and um you know uh, I, so for that reason i'm not going to i'm going to upload this this is going to go up but i i would consider it to be a mild failure somewhat if only because we're just not really we haven't been doing this i mean this is the second episode you know we haven't been doing it long enough to be able to talk about really complicated uh, complex issues like this and especially you know this is a farce you know it's 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 there's a lot to break down and, and at the same time there isn't you know and it's not it's not as comprehensible as i would have liked it to be you know edna was edna was pretty tough too but at least it had a, a point to it and at least it you know it was it there were there were things to talk about um i would like to do something a little more easy i guess and then we'll we'll record that and then we'll upload that probably today as well we'll upload both of them so you'll get two videos in in one day that'll be good two episodes but um yeah that's the plan and uh now that simone's on board we're definitely going to do that so right after this we're going to get uh started with episode three so uh look forward to that ladies and gentlemen uh so now we're gonna we're gonna close with a, a would you rather this one's an interesting one i i'm a bit torn on it myself but um w- would you rather have no wi-fi or no music Um, I think in my situation right now, school is about to start again, and so <laughs> no Wi-Fi. I don't know. I can leave. Uh, then I can do such. Thing. I don't have much opportunities. With, I don't have access with books, and I can only access these things and with the help of the internet. So I think so. <laughs> so. No, uh, no music rather than Wi-Fi. <laughs> think so. Ah, uh, I gotcha. Okay, I would, I would. Um, honestly, I'd probably do no Wi-Fi because I just, I don't really. I go on the, I, I can't. I, I have this thing. I, I get like really addicted to um, going on YouTube and stuff, and I waste a lot of time on the internet. So I, I think it would actually be a lot more beneficial for me to not have it for a while, you know, because. If I don't have Wi-Fi, that's fine. I still have my video games. I still have my, you know, movies and stuff. I still have plenty of electri- you know, electronic whatever going on. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I I think without Wi-Fi, I would have a lot more time to read. And I, I make a million excuses not to read. Um, but now that we're at the end of the episode, I guess I'm going to talk about this. I, uh, I'm actually talking about bias and stuff, political bias and shit. I'm actually, right now I'm reading a book called, it's a, it's a collection of essays published in 2002, uh, called um, what is it? How to Be Alone by Jonathan Franzen, and, and uh, I I don't I really don't like it so far. I gotta be honest, I don't like it. I kind of regret buying it. It was like eighteen bucks. Um, 
it's and it's kind of it ties perfectly back into uh, this whole thing. You know, there's a lot of that that left leaning bias. You know, um, friends and super biased. He was best friends with David Foster Wallace, who wrote who who gave a speech at um at a university called This Is Water. It was a commencement speech. It was actually it was made a it was a whole thing. It became a whole thing. It was so popular that it became its own little book and everything. But um, like they published the speech and it was powerful because it was good and it was it was all about this. You know, be moderate. Think for yourself, you know, take into account the fact that life is made up of a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives and they, there, there are reasons why everyone thinks the way they do and they, they all, everyone comes from somewhere, that, that whole notion of that and just, you know, have a little empathy, try to be a little more understanding, you know, um, I, I honestly don't really know how, uh, you know, Jonathan Franzen could have been best friends with, uh, or how David Foster Wallace could have been best friends with Franzen because Franzen is super biased and, and lame and, and a bad writer. And I just, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, uh, he's really exhausting. He wrote, he wrote a whole um, essay about Bill Clinton and how, um, you know, America shouldn't uh, care that Bill Clinton had sex with Monica Lewinsky, his, you know, his assistant or whatever, that whole controversy in the 90s, the late 90s, um, because there isn't any more privacy in the country anyway. And it just, it was such a hair split argument it was just, it was ridiculous and I, I i hate it i hate it when writers and artists and whatnot they think that they're important enough to talk about politics you know tell the goddamn story think about life you know look at look at things philosophically don't i don't care about your politics you know what i mean i, I don't care what carl ovick and politics are the only people's politics i care about are, are like the old fashion you know the older older you know like like, like 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 plato and and dostoevsky and shit but the only reason i even care about those ones is because they they, and they they themselves they had they usually had nuanced opinions on things i mean that's why they're classics that's why they are the greats of literature because they actually knew how to look at all sides of an issue you know um they're good examples to to uh to well to, to i guess metaphorically and figuratively and literally take a a leaf from i suppose but um yeah, take a take a page out of their books, uh, but yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, anything you want to you want to close out with, Simone? Uh, I agree with you with your politics. I don't know, people shouldn't care that much about it, or even one dwell on one point or one one perspective. They should be open minded about things because you know everyone has so much to say. It's not that. Just one idea at all times. I don't. Know. I don't know if I'm okay if I brought back about the the would you rather about the Wi-Fi. I, don't know. I think I can leave during the quarantine. It's been a month that I I don't have access to the internet, so then I can live without the internet. So you're gonna change your answer to uh, no Wi-Fi? Probably. <laughs> You know, the question is actually interesting because it says, would you rather go without Wi-Fi or without music? But don't you kind of need to listen to music with Wi-Fi these days? I mean, it's not like everybody has a vinyl collection. How do you figure that one out? No, oh, maybe I'll just listen to the radio. The radio? Yeah. yeah. But, but then you, you don't get yeah. to pick what's on the radio, though, you know? So you, you kind of have to go through a lot of bullshit. But to, to be honest, I don't like what the songs that are playing on the radio. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I think you should probably... You should probably switch your you should probably reverse your decision again you know i think it's kind of a lose-lose i think it shouldn't be about wi-fi and music it should be something else <laughs> because music uh nowadays comes with wi-fi and stuff okay well then how about this uh would you rather not have wi-fi or hot water in your shower uh uh i would rather <laughs> um i went I don't know. Uh, both things are works well. I think I, I don't have much access to hot bath. <laughs> I need to boil my water before I do it. So maybe I only have arm bath twice a year. I think. Well, what if what if you uh, what if you couldn't boil the water and you just had to take cold showers no matter what? Uh, oh, it's fine. Fine. Uh, I'm used to <laughs> cold water. I guess that's more of a, a first world issue then. Yeah, I don't know. That's good though. That's good. You, 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 it toughens you up, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that was a, a really shitty movie. And uh, I hope that the next one isn't as bad. I hope we actually get a good one that we can actually talk about. Even if it's not great, like I, I would rather... I, I just want something to talk about. But um, this was not really 
that. But uh, anyway, uh, this has been the second episode of the Imperial Tides podcast. I was your host, uh, Holden Caulfield, 21st century Holden Caulfield, with my uh, co-host here, Simone. And uh, thank you for watching. If you liked it, uh, if you liked hearing us, uh, please consider uh, giving the video a like, sharing, uh, subscribing, telling all your friends. You know, uh, we will get better eventually. I promise. Uh, without dragging this uh, outro out much longer, uh, bye. <laughs>